very excited being here. My name is Arnon Herkovitz. I'm from Tel Aviv University from the School of Education. I work hard on the presentation. Can you please show it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, this panel is um, one milestone among the few others that we have with our friends and colleagues from the University of Notre Dame, uh, Professor Alex Ambrose and Kevin Abbott over there. And I want to welcome them to Israel. Welcome. <laughs> so, so this morning, oh, wait a minute. So the updated one. or by bringing into the same panel five leading institutes in Israel. This is a great achievement as well. Um, I want to thank Dr. Tal Sofer from Tel Aviv University School of Education for coordinating this panel. It wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been happened without her. So thank you, Tal. We will discuss new pedagogical models beyond COVID-19. So our purpose is to start a discussion from what happened during COVID and trying to think about post-COVID era if it arrives uh, at some point. Each of the presenters will have seven minutes sharp to present whatever they want. Yeah, I, I have a, a timer and it, it will beep after seven minutes. And then we'll have some moderated discussion and maybe we'll have some time. Q&A. So uh, without further ado, I invite Alex. Uh, he is the director of learning research in Notre Dame University in Indiana, USA, and the founder of the Research and Assessment for Learning, sorry, Research and Assessment for Learning Design Lab with the Notre Dame Learning Caneb Center for Teaching Excellence. It was a kind of a long one. Um, I asked each one of the presenters to share with us some non-academic anecdote about themselves, something that you will not find in their bio. Alex sent me three fascinating details. He felt that I would choose one of them, and instead I'll give you all of them. So, um, where is it? Somewhere here. Okay, you can start that by bringing out your... Uh, okay, yeah, I have it here. Okay, so during the summers, you can find Alex with his two dogs and two daughters RVing on the southwest corner of the Great Lake, Michigan, which is the main place. Uh, just recently, he graduated from a 200 hour yoga teacher training program. He will be teaching, uh, wait with a while, he will be teaching. Uh, trauma informed yoga in the fall. Okay. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> he was. Maybe we can change it to a yoga yes. <laughs> And uh, he was a former infantry officer that was awarded Bronze Star during Operational Iraqi Freedom. So, Thank you so much. Um, so happy to be here with my friends and these new friends. Uh, I heard seven minutes sharp, so I'll jump into it really quick and give you some of the highlights of the study that we've done uh, during, through COVID. And moving fast, so I have the link here, the bit.ly um, slash IGCL hybrid flex MD. If I go too fast, you can always access it, see some of the results and get like, some more information. But yes, yeah, so I'll be talking about hybrid flex for teaching and learning what we learned on our campus uh, at Notre Dame. Uh, 
I live in Bel Air Campus, uh, founded in 1842, located, as uh, Brown mentioned, in the Midwest, two hours east of Chicago. Uh, we're a top 20 institution, private Catholic based university, not as big as Tel Aviv University, with 13,000, um, 9,000 undergraduates. And that's where most of the study was looking at the undergraduate experience uh, during COVID. This is a peek into how our classrooms shifted. Uh, COVID March 2020, by August 2020, our first semester back, we did open up face-to-face uh, -face, uh, for classrooms. So we did major enhancements in our classrooms by putting second monitors, so the Zoom conference would have a student gallery and share screen. And then we also had uh, these here stickers that put six students six, foot, six feet apart. And we invested a lot of technology in European cameras that allowed the remote students to see. Here with microphones, uh, it's social as, as you can see, we have our classroom uh, capacity went down significantly. Social distancing. We have two big research questions: How were these classrooms updated for COVID nineteen? How could this high class classroom be improved for future semesters as we were moving through the pandemic? Second. How can the experiences of in-person and remote learners and instructors be improved uh, for increased flexibility uh, beyond, beyond COVID as well? So our big, we did a couple different data collections, interviews, observations, but I'll just report some of the highlights in the survey. 1,200 students, 30 faculty from a couple different uh, colleges, a couple different courses, large, medium, small. <laughs> 97% of students, same with instructors, held most of the classes face-to-face. 42% -face. of students, 23% of faculty attended uh, a Zoom or remote, even though they didn't have to, so they chose to go remote. 67% uh, of students, 70% of faculty really appreciated having the ability to teach in these three modalities, in-person, live, and asynchronous recordings. 62% uh, of students, 70% of faculty, safe and then 64 percent of students and 70 percent of faculty felt the upgrades that we made the major investments of enhancing these classrooms with lecture care capture with zoom conferencing they all thought that was going to be very useful post, post pandemic <laughs> so the merging post pandemic pedagogy that we've been thinking about is uh, instead of limiting instructors to just one single model that narrows the option to do traditional face-to-face -face or all online or blending both the hybrid or many of us got confused in the early days of uh, COVID about this high flex of actually requiring all three different modalities what we learned is it's really important to trust the faculty trust the students and give them the most flexibility <coughs> possible to um, to empower them the best two or three not all three not to, but we'd like to have this pick two out of the three um, modalities. And I'll show you this graphic here in a second. So I think we all, after COVID, as education technologists, love that everybody started using these terms that we've been using for a while, asynchronous, synchronous, in-person, online. Um, so maybe those separate, separate buckets or separate quadrants aren't so separate that we really need to be looking and moving through the two or three best ones that make sense. Um, for our individual courses, week to week, classes, uh, and the semesters moving forward. Our classroom is the biggest thing we learned from this, this investment this, this ability to do lecture capture for the asynchronous. Uh, students really reported that they love to get, especially the physics, the math, the chemistry, where they got a lot of chalk talk. They really enjoyed getting with it. Even if they were in class present, they love to get the recording notes. Uh, to be able to watch for their exams, uh, for study for the exams. Um, having the ability to live stream students or guest speakers in, in virtual offices, office hours were very, very popular. And lastly, our typical uh, synchronous, but more enhanced, more, more than ever, students were bringing their own devices and instructors were using online technologies, even in the face to face collaborative using a lot of thoughts, chats, polls, and those types of things. So we're really excited moving forward that because our Classroom was enhanced, 
that the teaching or learning and modalities and practices are enhanced and we have more options. And to wrap up, the key takeaways, um, students and instructors were a residential campus, so they can actually prefer in-person uh, face to face. We rather remote attend than this class. I was another few professors said even if it was a minor sickness or a mental health, they really rather do remote in than this class. And then they found the report an official. Instructors need that freedom to choose which modality works best. And again, with the current technology, we can really support higher levels of active learning in our classrooms. So um, with that, a bunch of links if you want to learn more. We wrote a paper together. We've got papers up there. We have other presentations we've done together. Uh, so if you'd like to learn more about this work, we'd be happy to, to share that with you. Can we get up for a second? Yes. Thank you. Oh. Remember this link. Vivian, uh, I use the uh, Apple device. Excuse me. Do you want to photo maybe the, the Bitly link would probably be most useful? Yes, to get that all of the. Everything. Yes, yes, thank you. This Bitly link, if you take a picture of this, that will get you to the reference link and have all the links to the link. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, so feel free to contact me. Uh, we'll come up. I'd uh, love to talk more. About this with you and work for you. So, thank you so much. All right. Uh, thank you. So, uh, each of the presenters will present um, an institute level perspective. So, here we saw one, and for overcoming political <coughs> issues and uh, any kind of problems, we order the presenters by geographic location, <laughs> geographic distance. So we started from the farthest, and we move to, is it OK uh, if I call you Costas? Yeah, yeah, of course. All right. So our second speaker is uh, Professor Konstantinos Petridis. Did I get it right? All right, Costas. He's a faculty at the Department of Electronic Engineering at the Hellenic, Hellenic Mediterranean University where he serves as the director of the International Relations Office. Um, people call him the guy that never never stops to think. <laughs> they think that I, I think. <laughs> All right, so. So I can start, no? Yes, you have no uh, presentation. Yeah, because right? I, I have ordered to have no presentation. That's why I'm like, yes. So I'm, I'm keeping my notes. So I had to engineer very fast. Right. My name is Konstantinos Petridis. Um, I'm an associate professor. My research activities in laser physics, so I have nothing to do with this. I'm doing this from uh, curiosity and because I admire very much what are you doing regarding teaching, teaching science. In Europe, teaching science is not so very much appreciated since we are looking, uh, we invest a lot in, in core, let's say, science, like in my case, in photonics and nanotechnology, and the main uh, funding that we receive from Horizon Europe it has to do with this technology. But we know, and has been realized very well, that uh, if we don't educate our students well, we don't have research students that they, ha they are motivated and they can drive the work. So we are trying now um, to direct our priorities and include among our priorities the education. So I'm, very, I'm here in order to present you some lessons that we have learned and some new policies that we are doing uh, within uh, my university. My university is a small university located in the island of Crete. You know, Crete is very close here, so the weather is similar. Uh, but also I represent and I will describe to you policies that we apply in the European universities that I represent, because also I'm participating in the creation of the European Alliance, European University Alliance, which is the excellence program regarding in Europe, how to make alliances in order to be more competitive to the US. So I, I, represent, I represent one of these 41 alliances, and I will, I will show to you that in Europe, the main priority right now is to move blended. <coughs> Flexi, if I give you know, the note to you. Anything in Europe now is blended. So we started all the all our activities starting from training schools online, and then we are meeting face to face in order to present and mainly to network. But I will tell you why in my university we consider you know the lessons that we have learned from the online experience and we're going to keep them. For example, I will start with uh, the students. For the students, a great opportunity, and they would like to keep the online. 
even though that they would like to be face to face because they can access the material whenever they want. Secondly, you know, they can build their confidence since we have integrated all our assessment into the Moodle, so they can go, they can test, you know, their knowledge, and then you know the feedback comes immediately. We don't, they don't have to wait me whenever I'm going to think and whenever I'm going to remember to provide them the feedback. Secondly, we can introduce them, you know, the variety of lecturers. So we can introduce by lecturers, you know, from Italy, from uh, from France, from Israel, in order to teach along me online or in a blended way the same topic from, from a different point of view. If we go now to the teachers, why online is important? First of all, we train our teachers, you know, to exploit the learning analytics. So in order to provide a more personalized education by looking the profile and by following the digital fingerprints of our students, we can identify using the help of artificial intelligence right now which students you know are uh, under risk so we can provide immediately an access uh, for the teacher another thing is like that we're using new pedagogies not new you know they exist you know many years but because of the covid we now try to employ like the flipped classroom approach so as you said we record everything before the lecture the videos are there the, the tests before the the lecture are there the students they test their understanding and during the time that we are gathering together I have the time to go to a more further and more advanced topics or start not in the traditional way, rotate my back and start to write, but ask them questions. So the, the lecture starts from the questions. What do you uh, do understand? What you would like to discuss? And we are moving like this so they participate in a very dynamic way. And also, you know, the new systems and the new online systems provide me a, a more interactivity. It, 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 so, it shows you know, probably strange, but this is my personal perspective. I'm still in use, you know, Kahoot, all kinds of or tools like Metimeter in order to be more interactive and make my students to be with me. And, and also it gives me more time because I have the automated tutor in order to be involved more in my research and don't spend time in order to correct, you know, documents and, uh, and stuff like this. So for the universities, why it's important? For the European universities, it's important because we are moving to the fourth higher education revolution. We, are, we like to provide a more personalized education. We would like to address any one of you, but also whatever we are going to perform, the artificial intelligence or in general the technology, help us to tailor everything that we are doing in each one of you. So for, I will give you an example. If you are going to do one of these automated uh, uh, tests and you are, your replies are wrong, the second test, it, it is tailored based to your wrong answers. So we don't go you to another level, but we are trying to promote the other level based on your knowledge and a little bit to push it further. This is very much really related with the research, because when we are doing research, we have a line, and the research pushes this line a little bit upstairs, what do you know and what do you don't know. So we try to copy this philosophy also um, uh, to, uh, to the education. Uh, so the universities, uh, finally, the universities you know, in the era that we're living right now, like the Amazon, like, you know, everything is very fast. We don't want to be a starting campus. So through the European University Alliance, with the help of the online, we can provide everything from 10 different campuses in Europe. So we provide all our curricula, all our postgraduate studies. You know, they have been, we are working now in order to design, to be more homogenized, but, you know, from the different 10 campuses. So we can reach everyone, not only within the campus, also beyond the campus. So, I mean, this is like, why do we consider this, you know, very high? During the COVID, we make a research with 2,500 Greek students, undergraduate students. What was the problems and the barriers during the COVID-19? So we identified like three kinds of categories. You will tell me, when I have a minute, you will tell me. So um, the, the first category that we face is le learning instructor problems. So the main issues that the students they have mentioned is like the lack of digital competencies. And I was in a conference together with some professors in Harvard, and even a Harvard student mentioned this, that our teachers, they lack competencies how to teach online. Mm -hmm. So in order to address this, we are organizing webinars, schools for our teachers as a part of the alliance. Now, the main problem regarding, this is the main problem regarding uh, learning instruction. A learner to learner is more mainly the, the socialization. They felt alone. But this has been solved because we have introduced in our LMS, you know, chatting rooms, and also the tutor is available in 24 hours, uh, anytime that they want, with the help of um, uh, avatars in order to provide, you know, some kind of answer. But this is like in, in a pilot phase. And also another problem that we face is learning content. Sometimes the professor did not upload, you know, all the material, or the libraries, the library uh, uh, content is not available uh, online, so the students they lack the access of this. Uh, this uh, document, and this is under the working in order to convert everything that is available in the libraries to be online. 
And finally, it was the networking in Greece. We have a lot of islands, so this was a kind of challenge. But because of the COVID, the government now has upgraded the networking to be as fast as possible in all other degrees. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we are now moving to Israel, and we have our Israeli presenters from north to south. So we'll start with our northmost representative, uh, Olga Shuntonov, head of the Center for Promotion Learning and teaching at the Tech Theater in Haifa. When Olga was a teenage, teenager, she won third place in junior badminton tournament for her age group, which was the peak of her long standing sports career. <laughs> forgot to mention is that there were only four competitors in my age group. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that <laughs> that's the most important part of that. This is why it's not on my CV. So. Uh, okay, hi everybody. So we're short of time and I'm going to talk fast. I'm not sure how I'm going to do that. So I'm going to try. No, it's okay. Okay, so uh, as, uh, since I'm representing the Technion, I'm going to talk about the Technion, but I assume that most of us uh, are experiencing the same challenges. Um, so the Technion used to be like an ecosystem for students and teachers to meet, to interact. They used to study there, teach there, live there. I got married there. So it was like really live and uh, present and uh, fun and then COVID. And then we started asking ourselves questions. Those questions we were asking them before, because some of the issues were there prior to the uh, crisis. But now the students actually had the experience of staying at home with my mom and dad cooking for me, doing my laundry. And, uh, and I still get the materials. I get the best materials from the best teachers, from the best universities. I don't even have to study from my own professor. I can do it for taking MIT classes, whatever I want. Everything is there. So, so why should they come back? The Technion had one semester fully online. Then we had like mixed kind of things. So the teachers had to come. Some of the students came. Most of them watched the videos through the videos or the uh, Zoom. Uh, during class, we had cameras installed in all classrooms. And that worked for a while. And then uh, Technion decided to go back face to face. So we're face to face. And still, students are asking for videos. They're asking for, for Zoom. And they're saying, well, it's possible you have everything there why can't we get it i do want to stay in my pajamas at my house and and have that why why can't i have that so they're asking questions which make us ask those questions as well do we still provide them with the added value do we still provide the ecosystem how, how can we how can we not find that but how can we deal with it what can we do with it are we still relevant which makes us reinvent everything uh, whatever everything well, basically, yes, anything that has to do with teaching them, with interacting with them. So as Professor Uni Sivan stated in uh, his last uh, report, one of the most important post-COVID cha challenges we're facing is how to make best use of student time on campus while we're moving forward with our goal of including more digital <laughs> elements. <laughs> in technical courses, we're also aware of the crucial value of physical presence on campus. So we are pushing digital. We are, because it's there, it can provide us with a lot of tools, a lot of methods, it's, it's very important. And, but, but still, do we need the presence? If we do, how do we make them come back? How do we make the campus something attractive? So, of course, spaces, okay? We can't ignore spaces, we are talking about spaces. We want to provide them spaces for out-of-class experiences, right? When they're there and they need to study, they need to interact, they need to create their own uh, and the fun activities, we have a PlayStation there, and we need to provide them with spaces where they can study by themselves, they can study in groups, they can do whatever they need to do while there. But that's not enough, and we're also creating uh, in-class spaces, OK? 
Okay, so we're taking whatever space we have. Okay, so this, for example, is a classical kind of classroom, and we're flexing that. We're trying to work with whatever we have, but at the same time, we're creating new, uh, flexible spaces. We put a lot of technology in them to be used or not to be used, but we are providing the teachers and the students uh, with those options. But that's also not enough. So we're also adding the uh, virtual spaces because we do want to connect them. We want to enable flexibility as much as we can. So we're using all kinds of uh, virtual spaces. You can see here with the Engagely, which is a platform uh, that uh, replaces Zoom for academic environment. Really nice uh, uh, option. So those are really uh, present for us at the Technion now, but I wanted to focus a bit on what we, what else we do at the Technion to uh, face the challenges, okay? So those challenges are not gonna disappear. We, we're living in a really rapidly moving on world and we need to provide our teachers and our students with a lot of support, okay? Those are the three things that we're dealing with now as a center for promotion of learning and teaching and as a Technion uh, itself. So how do we support that? How do we support the teachers, the students in their efforts? How do we provide them with meaningful education? And what's the extra value of that? And how we measure? How do we decide if what we do actually works? Because we know it's fun, not fun, difficult, uh, requires a lot of efforts from the teacher, but does it work? Is the learning more meaningful? Is the learning better? So those are the questions. Let's see if it's gonna work, the fun part. Huh. <laughs> I like that. Okay, so the distributed support that we provide, we've been implementing a new work model for our center. It's based on the science uh, education initiative that was developed by Professor Carl Weiman in 2007. But here at the Technion, we just started. We take discipline-based <coughs> experts. They come from the discipline. They usually have PhD in the same discipline. For example, we have a, a doctor of physics at the, at the Department of Physics, and, but he's also really passionate about teaching and learning. Okay, so he provides the connection. He's the link. He's the link between the center and the department. So based on that model, we can, first of all, upscale. Okay, we can reach out to all the faculties. We can have the faculty um, talk to us and tell us those are our priorities for the semester. And, and it's always different so you have Marina here she's uh, representing uh, <laughs> our guys she she's actually stayed, uh, sitting in the medicine uh, department and working really nice with them so that's that's amazing that we can provide the support that the specific faculty need they understand the discipline but they also understand the pedagogy and that provides the link they enable change at the faculty they enable community discussing up are asking questions that have to do with learning and not just the science. So that's really important, but that's one aspect. And then the other aspect is how do we make our teaching and learning meaningful using the digital tools, not necessarily using them. How do we use them? Where do we use them? So we are trying all kinds of things. How do we make reading more social? How do we make connections between students to enable different disciplines talk together? Uh, we create spaces for that as well, okay? But we have to think how do we incorporate to ah, that's it, not one minute. Okay, so I'm gonna skip that and I'm just gonna say one word. We must remember that the challenges are there both for the teachers and for the students and those barriers that I don't have time to talk about, not less important than the barriers from the teachers. Okay, so that's the challenges that the Technion is uh, currently experiencing. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Olga. Technion uh, is my alma mater. So it's exciting and a dream that you showed in the second slide of the student when I was a student there. Yeah, and one of the faculty. All right. Uh, so we now have uh, Chevy. So we're heading to the center of Israel, right, uh, for guests from abroad. And we now have um, Dr. Chevy Gubrin of the newly formed Levitsky Wingate Academic Center. I've got it right. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's not the doctor. What is it? <laughs> Just skip the doctor. Ah, okay. Um, and Chevy is the head of the Center of 
innovative and optimal pitching. I try to translate this in Hebrew. Okay. Um, uh, Shevi's family has lived in Jerusalem for five generations. For a guest from abroad, this is a right. use in, uh, in Israel, it counts. And although she hasn't lived in the city for over a decade, she still refers to herself as Jerusalemite. <laughs> All right, so how much? Okay. <laughs> so my colleague that we present from the room and from the, the audience is uh, Professor Rolando Popish Baruch. Hi everybody, I'm glad to be here. Um, so I'd like to actually use uh, my seven minutes to present uh, an experimental model that we uh, implemented in the academic center in the UCB. Actually, we released the academic center only for two months, so. I feel more comfortable to talk about the University College of Education, where everything I will present was taken is taking place in. <coughs> uh, and just before before I start, I just want to say that uh, in this uh, conference there are many colleagues, some colleagues of mine, uh, presenting all kinds of uh, things that were done in our context, in the context of uh, of combining face-to-face -face and remote teaching. And so here I'm really going to focus on. One of the one of the models in order just to shed light on our uh, attempts. One more thing I want to say is that uh, we are all we all share uh, this uh, uh, this effort that uh, the Vitsky College of Education is has um, like a certain, another level of effort, which is we train teachers and educators. So in the, in a way for us, pedagogy is not only the medium; it is the message. So. Our goal is to for our, for our students to, to experience the kind of teaching, the kind of, kind of teaching and learning that we would like them to demonstrate in schools. So I think this uh, imposes on our on our uh, um, faculty you know, another kind of responsibility. So uh, I'll start. Uh, so as I said, we're doing. Okay. Alona, would you like just to say a few yeah. words about uh, and say a few words about yourself also, your position yeah. in the um, so uh, actually uh, being uh, two of us in two different uh, uh, offices, uh, Shevi in her uh, um, um, her um, uh, center and myself as head of the international office, we work together, and this is a good uh, example of doing things for the benefit of the, uh, of the institution uh, as at large. So we are part of this um, uh, project, which you will hear about in full detail in another uh, session further along. And this, uh, this project was focused on uh, optimization and academic inclusion via distance teaching and learning. And the project was accepted before COVID. Um, uh, as part of the project, we focused on four, uh, four pilot uh, um, courses in which we, uh, we implemented uh, principles of inclusion of marginalized populations. Now, this was an issue because we know that in distance learning, the uh, populations that were most injured, so to speak, were these marginalized populations. So we are doing these, um, this this uh, effort together with Chevy and the project. And this and this is really just a, 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 really is, uh, an example of, of some of the efforts that we're doing. But then, and, and as I was said, why doesn't it uh, go further? Then can Corona and um, and uh, like uh, my colleague here, we did <coughs> run a survey, and uh, we, we I think like like everyone, like everyone, I think we also in our institutes amazing innovation and, and solutions that our uh, faculty develop in their courses. So we really wanted to, and we wanted to capitalize on this. We didn't want this lesson to fail. We were, we were terrified of the possibility that once we, uh, things get uh, go back to normal, the campuses will press on coming back, and we really wanted to create a counter, a counter uh, movement. So we went to the people and we asked them, and what, what you can see here, it's not in much uh, less detail, but what you can see here, we just asked uh, one of the general questions, what would you like? And you can see that both groups, faculty and students, more students, 
would, would uh, prefer to continue online teaching either either partially or fully. <coughs> So this was a very good. Uh, this was a very good uh, message, very strong message for us, for our management. Mm -hmm. And um, so here, I'm, I'm, now I want to present the model that I'm talking about. And uh, keep in mind <coughs> that it starts in a very formal way. We decided. We decided to to create a <coughs> create a routine. We decided to uh, to change the academic calendar. What we did was to um, was to mark three weeks each semester that were the, in which the, camp, the, the, the studies will be uh, held remotely off campus. Mm -hmm. We can say how, we can say in what way, just off campus. Approximately, okay, we have had approximately one week out of four. Okay, this is the. So this is very technical, and of course we wanted we we, we didn't want um, and it has to be it had to, it had to be across the board because we didn't want to we had to avoid balagan you know everyone so across the board all the campus remote and uh, in order for this not to go to the default uh, pedagogy of synchronic uh, Zoom uh, uh, lecture okay uh, what we did was uh, to um, <coughs> To supply, to, the, to supply the faculty with, uh, to, to, to support everyone actually, with uh, pedagogical aids and instruction. And we had all kinds of things. I just demonstrated a few of them, okay? So what we did, can we shut the phone? <laughs> so this is, a, this is an example of a very wide, I think, I think all of you know all of this. It's nothing new here, but we just wanted to create a sort of pedagogical menu. And it's not even very systematic because you can, you can see all kinds of, uh, of, of, uh, of levels of, of pedagogy of here, just for our speak, uh, English speaker speaking quality um, show. We're talking about flipped classroom and game based learning, inquiry, inquiry based learning, and, and, and many, many more. And all of these are Sikhan. All of these could be. All of this could be, you can see the, in the QR code here, you could access to a lot of information and, and support and, and guidance, both from our uh, staff and from, from uh, uh, independent learning. And also, for example, this is another example. I, I just want to say, okay. one of the things we realized is that we have to walk the talk, which means if we are talk, if we are believe that people if, if people can learn anywhere, in any way, in any place, at any time, and they can learn by themselves, we have to supply to to help people do that. So what we did is this is just an example. We initiated a, a WhatsApp group and we started sending pulses, tiny pulses, bite-sized pulses of information, of ideas, in all these kinds of the ideas of pedagogies and etc. So, Alona, okay, Alona, we, you can go to Alona's uh, afterwards, just to summarize. What we did was, if I want to uh, conceptualize what we did, we started forming, we, we, we created a systemic regulatory change that encouraged and fostered, actually, uh, transformation and uh, facilitated pedagogical learning change. This is actually the idea. Okay, so, there, so just to push back to that point, you can read the, the you can read all the uh, all the um, benefits or principles that they guided us, and I think again, bear, bear in mind that uh, but we're dealing with teachers, so I, I believe that what we did was what we're doing now, and this was the past year, and we had a uh, very good uh, uh, responses, and we're going to the next year in the same way. center of Tel Aviv and we move on to okay. Tel Aviv University and we now have Dr. Tatsuper, the head of Virtual Town Digital Pedagogy Unit at Tel Aviv University. Um, you may be interested to know that prior to her academic endeavors, Tal was a saxophone and clarinet player and she even played in an orchestra.
extra under the baton of the great Zubi Mehta. Oh. I didn't know that until yesterday. <laughs> yeah. It's cool. Uh, don't count the rest of the minutes because I want to say thank you and welcome. <laughs> okay. Okay. So first, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. For helping me and us to organize this session. Um, thank you for the panelists from all over the university that actually um, came and um, raised the glass to, uh, to be here and to share the insights. And finally, but most important, thank you for the guests from outside, from the Notre Dame University, Grace Kevin is there, and Phil Grace that come all over to share with us your thoughts, your inputs into this uh, important. So now you can All right. my seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Tel Aviv University. I? Actually, I will uh, speak a little bit from the macro level. Um, so from our guests outside the Israel, Tel Aviv University composed of uh, nine faculties from the humanities to exact science to medicine, all kinds of faculties, which mean that the students are heterogeneous from different um, um, angles, different fields, or different needs, as well as the instructors. So we have to cope with all these when we come into digital um, pedagogy and all the needs created to uh, pedagogy. Um, but I would like to go a step back when we started the COVID March 2020, we all came into a very strange situation. We found ourselves isolated. Uh, our university, all of us, actually had to act very fast what to do, how to maintain the learning without any uh, interruptions, and what we are doing. So in that very bizarre situation, when we call it the VUCA world or the VUCA reality, where what will be uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity become our new reality. The new reality that higher education, as well as other university, needs to face. And in that situation, when you come to the very traditional, you know, Rogers model about the fusion of innovation, when you go slowly by slowly, when the innovators are the first, and then come the early majority, the late, we are struggling because most of the instructors were still at that age. They are not actually crossing the chasm, as Moore already said. What we are doing, so here comes the COVID. And all of a sudden, all the actually instructors became innovators. But we call it emergency remote teaching. It's not the regular atmosphere that we used to do. We have to teach them in no time how to use technology, how to use it in their own teaching. So all of a sudden, we found ourselves in a very new situation. And during the, uh, this period, we found that several and various models or pedagogical method models were implemented. We started with the fully online because all of us were isolated. We also sit at home to teach as we heard before, as part of us with pajamas, part of us in other situations. <coughs> we found ourselves either in synchronic or asynchronic modes with a lot of other problems like to open the camera, not to open the camera, how we deal with the students, find ourselves as an instructor sometimes, you know, talking to like a blank screen, which was not really pleasant for us as instructors, but also for the students' point of view, how we can actually uh, engage them. But all of a sudden, since, since the COVID was, uh, or the restriction reduced a little bit, new other models was erased. One of them, which we all face, is the hybrid some kind of um, combination between hybrid and flexible learning because still some of the students and instructors were at home. So we need in synchronic ways to teach. And uh, all of a sudden the university was equipped more than 250 classes with autonomous uh, cameras. And we as a support center had to uh, instruct the students how to juggle this technology between pedagogy and technology. They need to, like a clown, sit here and to do some kind of, okay, now I'm talking to um, Moshe, he is at home, and now I'm speaking with Renat, she's at class. And how we are doing all this kind of instruction. That was a really big um, challenge for us in like 
no time to uh, instruct, to educate, to uh, not educate, to guide an uh, instructor how to use it. So one of the main things that couldn't be unless the organization has this resilience to cope with all this changing situation. And when I'm talking about resilience, which is this is, uh, I think, the most important thing for organization today, I'm talking about readiness, readiness of the organization in terms of the infrastructure, of the support that they can give in all time and changing to uh, instructors and students. Also, of course, the preparations and long-term strategy. And for that, I can say that Tel Aviv University, for more than two decades, promoting online learning is part of their strategic goal. It's not that we started from the COVID. We started very, very um, long time ago with all this uh, building, all this infrastructure. You can look. So if you can look at the challenge that we found across uh, this period that we had a lot of um, um, surveys, assessments, interviews with students and instructors, we can see four main groups. Privacy issues, emotions, pedagogy, and uh, technology. Um, if, we look, if we look deeper, it's really interesting to see that um, this actually bottom <coughs> chart it's from the end of the semester. We did some survey uh, in the beginning and at the end. I will show you only the, the end one. Um, that actually we asked the, the instructor about they, their concerns or challenges. We took, you can see here on this uh, chart the advantages versus the challenges. And the scope of the level <coughs> is actually the intents of the statements that were actually uh, seen. And it's interesting to see that the most challenging for them was the communication, communication with the students uh, during the class, after the class, how we are doing better. <coughs> also, you can see that the advantages, but also some part of the challenges were the teaching and learning methods. During the period, they embraced new methods, but still they see it as challenges and advantages. And also the interesting to see is the software, because we learn, they learn a little bit how to use technology. Um, I will forward. This is really interesting also to see uh, what we asked is uh, both students and instructors to uh, actually rate their uh, satisfaction from a different models. And what we can see here is what we heard before actually, that the instructors still prefer the face-to-face -face models to be more in class in a traditional, uh, I'm finishing, in a traditional uh, but what we can see in the students, for example, is that more of the same, all the models are rated medium and we start to synchronic and learning um, with Zoom. And if we can summarize in a really brief, we can see that, um, of course, I talked about resilience and there's a need to build resilience today even more than before, which we need the suitable technology infrastructure and the technopedagogical support, which is a core center to uh, accompany all these uh, processes. But most of all, and I think like the previous uh, speaker also mentioned, we need new approach of pedagogical model. When I'm talking about that, we talked also how to engage the students, how to create a new atmosphere for them to be and to, um, to teach. Um, that from the one side, they want to, um, to give their freedom, their flexibility to choose where to learn, how to learn, and what, uh, and in what time. On the other side, the instructors want to keep the traditional and the um, old, we call it the old fashioned, you know, teaching. So reaching this gap, reaching this balance, this is our main challenge for the future. Thank you. Okay. And we we'll move uh, southeast Jerusalem, and we we'll now have a professor Rishon Har of the Institute of Chemistry at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And besides his academic achievements in the field of chemistry, Roy holds a private pilot license and is intrigued by archaeology. 
Okay, so I'm, uh, I, as a chemist, I'm uh, panicked to deliver a talk uh, without any slides in my back. Uh, but uh, I decided to do something else when uh, Tal presented me this uh, opportunity challenge uh, uh, to present uh, to you the uh, status of uh, the Hebrew University. I decided not to focus on the highlights, but to pretty much uh, get some kind of uh, real assessment of what what is going on right now and where we're heading. What have we learned? Uh, but really not showing you the uh, uh, the highlights, but to pretty much to understand what is the sentiment uh, between teachers and, and students uh, at the Hebrew University. So I called it uh, is it a tidal wave or a high curve? And just to explain the terms, tidal wave is something that comes in and goes as it came. It may leave a trail of destruction, but after renovation, you don't know that it happened. The hype curve is something that starts with a surge of uh, interest and excitement, and then the, when, when the excitement phases off, then there is a decline, almost to the initial state, but if it was real, <coughs> it will continue with a, with a certain slope to the future. Many technologies are adopted this way, if they're really real and addresses address a, a, an important uh, uh, thing. Okay, so I would like to offer you my analysis. And in order for it not to be my own personal opinions, what I did is to approach uh, the 10, uh, 10 vice deans uh, for teaching across the university from experimental to humanities, and um, also four um, uh, teaching and learning center uh, professionals, uh, techno-pedagogical uh, guys uh, that work with me in the teaching and learning center and to ask their opinion and also at the end I will present also the students uh, angle on this uh, which I think is uh, kind of interesting on its own. So just a little bit of um, all of them were presented with the question of what is the data, what was, what is the difference from now, not at the center of the hype, but now compared to pre-COVID era and where do you think it's going to go? So just uh, a few dry numbers on usage, online voting doubled from before COVID, uh, peer assessment doubled as well, active forum management plus 50%, collaborative activity products times 4.5 times more activities than what we had pre-COVID, more than 3,200 activities uh, that were counted on new categories that have not existed before at all. Uh, most of them collaborative, which is amazing when people are actually remotely uh, working. And additionally, our online uh, uh, teaching unit that uh, produces new courses just can't hold the demand right now. They are manufacturing uh, more than that. So I'd like to um, divide this analysis for all the phases of learning, in class, after class, and end of course, mm -hmm. and just give you, you know, project the sentiment from the units uh, of what's going on in the Hebrew University. So in class, okay, uh, advanced technologies that we're using. Hybrid teaching, I could say uh, honestly, complete failure. Hybrid teaching, I mean, when you teach together simultaneously to a face-to-face to -face crowd and in the background to people that are remote. So nobody likes this. Complete failure, sorry for the presenters out there. Okay. Massive return to frontal teaching with a big sigh of relief. People really like it. The thing is that uh, teachers felt the load of uh, innovating and, and sometimes it was, I mean, they're the weak link. Maybe it's not them, it's their time. Yeah, it requires a lot of time, so it's the weak link. But in parallel, there is an increased adoption of, uh, of uh, new technologies and demand for use uh, for uh, <coughs> model activities, especially all about uh, the LMS, of uh, new model activities. In some, in some units, it's very pronounced. And the main important thing there, it's driven by the management of that unit, by the leadership of that unit. If the leadership believes in it, then it will project it to the teachers and they would adopt it. If they don't, well, it looks like that. So I think it's a very uh, important take home message. There are new opportunities. So many courses, not a lot, I mean, not across, but uh, many courses could be now delivered to remote, uh, uh, remote audiences. So that opens really new opportunities that are important. If uh, people travel to conferences, they don't have to miss class. They can, I mean, their avatar from last year can deliver the class. Actually, you did it when I went to Morocco this semester. Um, and the available infrastructure has become the bottleneck 
And I think this is good news because it means that the demand is high and this bottleneck could be solved because we can install more systems or whatever is needed. So that, that's kind of interesting. Before COVID, we had a lot of infrastructure, not a lot of demand. Now it's actually nice. Um, another thing in class, re session recording. I think this is the main game changer. No doubt about this big change. Um, the number of recorded classes uh, quadrupled at the university. We had 40 classes, now we have over 150 across all campuses, not just the sciences. And what, a, what is the general sentiment? In a nutshell, students love it, teachers hate it. <laughs> just like that. Why do students like it? Uh, well, they say it increases the effectiveness of learning. Sure, they can run it faster, back and forth, and so on. It enables combining work and study, which is important because a lot of students now have to have to work. Teachers hate them mainly because the level of participation has dropped down. And when your class has now 25% and even 10% of attendance, it throws you back to front-end teaching because you can't have a discussion. So that's a big, big question. Um, and it is felt also in courses that were recorded pre-COVID, mine for example. And the reason is because then these courses were unique. So the students still have to come for the other classes. Now they don't have to come for any of these classes. So um, yeah, it's kind of tough. Uh, so so we, we get to think about this change of, uh, change of, uh, of structure. And the main thing is that it also dissolves the framework of, of, uh, of study. So this is something that bothers the teachers. Uh, because it puts a lot of responsibility on the students and the question is can they hold it? time management and so on so the outcome is that some units completely banned uh, um, recordings together altogether after class formative assessment i think there is a, a an increase uh, this is the real high curve i think that there is an increase in formative assessment the exposure for all the teachers was very important and many of them adopted now uh, the um, i mean <clears throat> Well, uh, let me show here. <laughs> uh, what about the co uh, computerized exams at the end? Well, um, it helped. Com Oops, stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, computerized exams, online exams, remote exams, complete failure. I mean, people don't want to do it anymore. There is an in inherent uh, problem there. I mean, the online proctoring and privacy, they just don't work together. Mm -hmm. It will never work. Mm -hmm. But in campus computerized exam is a good thing it completed the transition that already started before in law and medicine and there is some interest also in in, uh, in sciences and in, uh, in in computer science as well so in summary because i had to show, get it short i think in, in in some aspects it was just a tidal uh, uh, tidal wave meaning hybrid teaching remote exams came and went it was a you know the need of the hour it went, but it is a high curve in some senses of adopting new pedagogies. As a matter of fact, it stimulated people to think and be aware of the learning process, not just the investor teachers, everybody pretty much. And many of them, you know, it moved something there. So that's actually good. And I would like to finish with the students' uh, uh, take on this. Um, I got it from the uh, representative of the student union. And she said that, um, you know, it really that technologies really don't matter, she said. Uh, if the course is delivered frontally and passive, then, well, it doesn't matter. I mean, I don't have any advantage in face-to-face in -face learning. I would actually prefer the, uh, the recording. But if the course was dynamic and activated the students, then it doesn't matter as well, because uh, it's not the technology, it's what the teacher thinks about how to deliver the course. So technologies obviously promote this, but she says that uh, you know if, if the teachers think about how to deliver the course better and they use the right tool, technology is a facilitator, everything works great. Mm -hmm. So I think that our main challenges, and I'll finish with that, is to train teachers uh, to transition from frontal and passive mm -hmm. to active teaching. Technologies help, but they are just you know the promoter. So just let's ride the wave. There is a wave here, let's ride it in order to promote more than we had before. And we have to teach students how to improve their independent learning skills. And that's a big challenge. So I hope that it will be helpful for you. Thank you, Ray.
And our last presenter with also the southmost uh, representative is Dr. Yael Lin, the head of digital pedagogy at the unit for promoting the quality of teaching and learning at Ben Gurion University at the Negev. Um, and some years ago, I will not tell you how many, uh, Yael was a TV researcher and she was working on both news and current affairs and satirical programs like Zebusen. Wow. 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 <laughs> <laughs> research for the house for Israeli. Um, how can I, how do I move the slides? Can I do it? Yes. No. Um, okay, so hi. I'll try to do it quickly and also most of the challenges were already presented before me so I won't uh, repeat them. So like everyone, at first there was this imitation of the classroom into Zoom, then it forced people to apply uh, technology and then even to rethink the teaching in general. And like uh, Olga mentioned in the Technion, the, the, we're from the periphery, you see in the last uh, presenter. So even though it's only an hour from Tel Aviv in terms of Israel, and now we're from Tel Aviv is already peripheral. So, uh, so the strategy was returning to campus, like erasing everything, and it's COVID never uh, happened, and digital learning never happened, let's go back to campus. But as you uh, described before, this doesn't work both because of the students who require different and more uh, flexible uh, learning, and also some of the teachers and lecturers want to teach uh, differently, but some of the things that they adopted while uh, forced to do so during the pandemic, they also wanted to keep doing it. So this kind of moves us to the question, and I think in many ways I will continue to do what he is as uh, uh, raised, the question of how can we uh, like use the digital learning in a way that improves uh, learning, in ways that the students will, will have more advantage in coming to class, because some of the learning will be, uh, will be done independently outside of the classroom. So I'd like you to talk about uh, two strategies that we were using, uh, or that we're starting to use, and hopefully we'll implement uh, uh, more profoundly. One is dealing with the lack of, with low levels of prior knowledge, and one example is uh, in, this, in uh, Ben Gurion University, the students of the IAF flight course uh, are take, uh, uh, in addition to their uh, courses towards uh, a degree, they also have to take a course in physics that has to do with their, with their, uh, with their uh, with flight, and they have to learn uh, physics, and most of them, or not most of them, but many of them come with insufficient knowledge in math, they do only three units, and they need the level of five units, so we developed an online course that they, that they learn before they start their course, which kind of, uh, 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 um, overcomes the gap in their knowledge. So that was a success. And another thing that I would like to uh, discuss or present a little bit more uh, elaborately is this problem for memorizing to understand. Because in many of the classes, instead of trying to understand, we just try to memorize. And we try to kind of uh, develop a P2P, a peer-to-peer -peer model that will improve the learning. And we did this as a pilot on a course of physics to engineers. Um, so the ta challenges are low motivation. They don't want to learn this course. And some of them are also from industrial engineering. So they don't, they don't even understand why they need to learn physics. And there's lack of assimilation. They can't solve the similar problems if they're, if they're not exactly the same. This goes back to this memorizing instead of understanding. And the lack of knowledge transfer. The, what they study in one uh, course, or in this course, they can't transfer to other courses uh, I think, I think this is a problem that goes in different, in all, all over, not uh, only in this uh, course. So the P2P structure, uh, as we develop, is divided as the traditional way of lecture and the recitation uh, uh, co uh, course, but we call it, uh, but the lecture is not exactly a lecture, and the recitation course is more uh, as a workshop. And one focuses on the theory and concepts, but in a different way than just lecturing. And the workshop focuses on synthesis and implementation of knowledge. 
So just to describe the, uh, if there's time, there's a short movie that I, or short video to show you the, uh, it's in Hebrew, so I apologize for the English speakers, but uh, I will go through the things that, so even if you see the short video, you will be able to understand what's going on. So we have, uh, so the lecture, uh, so the lecture part of the course before class, they read collaborative using uh, perusal. Uh, it's, a, it's a digital tool. I won't go into it, but if anyone wants to hear more, it's a, Eric Mazor's tool, but if you want, you can ask me later if you don't want to uh, take too much time. During class, 10 minutes, 10 minute presentation of the concept, then an interactive question in which they respond through Hoopla. It's like Mentimeter, but we have a, a, an institutional license and it's implemented into, uh, into the Moodle. Then they discuss, they have time to discuss this question and then they answer the same question again. And there is a comparison mode in Moodle and we see uh, um, and, and more understand because they, they get the, the higher grades or they, they answer correct, more, more students answer correctly. So we see that this discussion uh, elevates and improves the knowledge. And after class, they have a formative assessment uh, in the, the Moodle uh, by doing uh, quizzes, uh, online quizzes. The recitation class, which is actually a uh, transforming teacher workshop. So before class, they watch videos, short videos, in which they see how, instead of the, you know, those who, who study in Israel know that the recitation class is just another lecture course in which the, the, in which the tutorials, the TAs, they teach again. So here, instead of doing that, they watch big, short videos in which they uh, uh, see how to solve the certain problems. We use uh, collaborative uh, and interactive tools like Anoto and H5P. Uh, on the video, one is for, uh, for uh, notes and one is for interactive uh, questions, pop-up questions on the video. During class, they sit in groups and they work on uh, open questions, which are similar to those that they have to uh, to afterwards submit as homework. So we see uh, an uh, improvement both in their, uh, in, the, in their grades and the exams. And we hope that we also see some more uh, assimilation of knowledge because I think the, the, the most pressing problem in the university is that we're really good in transferring the knowledge, but we're not as good as, as helping the students uh, assimilate the knowledge and remember something after they, they walk, walk out of the door from the exam. Um, and do I have time to show a three minute video? No? no? Okay, <laughs> so no. So, uh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so I kindly ask all the presenters uh, to come and sit here. And Alon, I hope you enjoyed as well, So due to the changing schedule and in what I heard and learned during this panel, I decided to change a bit the, the discussion. Uh, sorry. And I thought that we start with one moderated question, and then we'll move on to questions uh, from the audience. Uh, we saw some interesting things that uh, went across your talks. Uh, the one thing was what Olga called uh, the ecosystem, mm -hmm. basically. So in, in each of the presentation, we could identify some unique aspects of the institute that were evident. So maybe we'll start with this question. What are the uh, challenges and the advantages in teaching and learning in, the, in your institution today, like in this point in time, regarding uh, the unique ecosystem that you have in your institution. They weren't prepared for that. <laughs> uh, so you can take, uh, we'll, we'll have it uh, by volunteering. Maybe I'll start. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think that it's pretty much probably the same, and you mentioned it, 
students are not, they're not there, they're not coming. If before COVID we had the issue that they were not attending classes, they, it was felt before, and the attendance went down and down and down. Then after COVID, it's just like you said, it's not just there's this one course that is recorded, all of them are recorded, so they, they have no motivation to come. And the, 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 the search for the added value, so what, what can we give them to make them come? So we can give them active learning, we can give them uh, motivation to learn during the semester because all the pages are the same. And they're the same way. I mean, they wait for three days before the exam and watch all the videos at the same time. So that we want to give them everything we can so, so that they can come to campus, study the way we think they should, okay, provide them with all the infrastructure and everything. But then we encounter the, ch the challenges on their side, they're not interested. And so, so this is like, this is amazing. And how do, we, how do we explain that to the professors or the teachers, teaching assistants? You come to class, you are ready, you worked hard to prepare an active class. You want to discuss, you want them to do group projects, you want them to uh, work in pairs, and then oh, there's three students in the classroom. You can't really do much with that. So it frustrates them. And then I've invested so much time and efforts, and I learned how to use this tool that you suggested I use. And they did read the perusal chapter that uh, we published before. They discussed it already. So why can't they come? And I, I want to work with them. So those are the main challenges I think we are working on now. And infrastructure and support and methods and uh, digital tools and everything. We try to see how we can overcome the barriers from the student side and from the teacher side to provide a meaningful learning to the side. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. This is important because it, it has to do with the unique characteristics of the institute. In the Technion, having recorded lectures is part of the learning for decades before COVID. So we, we used to have one studio for recording, and we only recorded the best, best, best teachers, and mostly the basic courses, the large ones. We have been recording it with the student body, so they asked for specific things. <coughs> we had like an eye study. We had like this library video like and we used to go there and we used to study there and we used to sit there with our ears. So now we stopped the studio recording that we are doing as a center because you can you can record yourself in any of the classrooms at home. You don't really need that. So that's yeah, so we have everything recorded and most of the teachers don't feel comfortable with the recordings. So some of them actually deleted their recordings from a uh, COVID the Phase. Some of them do feel comfortable and they do provide the students, but then the students come to those who don't feel comfortable and say, well, that guy. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that affects their system. All right. Great. I'd like to highlight another aspect. Uh, on the one hand, there is a surge of uh, using new tools in Moodle, but then it also formative assessment, but then it also takes a lot of uh, big chunk of the grade, final grade, into the semester, and that affects the uh, satisfaction survey at the end, because it's all built on the fact that uh, you'll uh, answer, the students will answer at the end of the semester before they get their grades. So this is a, you know, a, a retracting force, uh, in, which causes uh, teachers who actually invested, uh, they get hurt by this because students, what they see is not the number of points that they secured for their final grade, it's the number of points that they lost, mm -hmm. okay? So <coughs> the question is how to deal with that. On the one hand, many students, many teachers would like to you know, develop more tools for formative assessment. They care about their learning, but then they get personally affected by it. So this is one of the things that, uh, that we see as a challenge at the university as well which means that we will have to uh, change the way that we assess the teaching. And I think it's a big challenge as well, no less than the confusion about what happens in the culture of learning now because of this recording. Okay, thank you. Yes, in our case, uh, the main challenge regarding the students is like how, are, how, how to realize how to combine the online and the face-to-face -to -face tools. So how to exploit fully you know, the recorded videos and how prepared they should be in order to come to the, le to the lecture room and be the active players of the lecture. Like to start with a question and drive the whole lecture by themselves. This is one of the main challenges that we try 
you know, to help them and try to show to them uh, like what are the benefits. Regarding the lecturers, of course, all of them, I think that you mentioned, but I disagree. Uh, it's like they consider that a uh, pre-recording is a loss of time, but you mentioned at the same time that it's not a loss of time. <coughs> because at the same time that they have the record, they can go to the conferences and they are not missing lectures. So we try also to convince them to follow this model. And also another challenge that we have among the students is like we would try to introduce them collaborative tools that we have learned you know, from other pedagogues. So we try to in introduce the Scrum in, in linking the real life problems within the physics that I'm doing the fundamental physics to, to link them how electronics are connected with the physics fundamentals and you can explain everything uh, um, uh, taking this real life example. This is a, a challenge how to link them and how to uh, promote the whole ecosystem to work like this. So just to uh, say this shortly, uh, uh, basically uh, we had three campuses, one campus in the north and two campuses in the center, so I think the structure already uh, pushes us to uh, draw fasting lessons. This is a brick uh, wall, but I want to say something about, I think uh, the real challenge is, is uh, it has to do with Again, structure. I think we are all used to think of academic features in containers or 14 containers, like a lesson. Like we divide our courses, and I think the, the big challenge is to, to really say goodbye to this and to, to start thinking what is the best way of what, well, how can we do the most of coming to the campus? How can we do the most of learning at the outside or alone or with friends? And, and this, this, from if we start thinking of this, this goes to a whole different way of improving the course, not by lessons mm -hmm. that have to be considered with any better. So I think this is a tectonic, this is a tectonic change. And I think this is not a uh, contextualized. I think we are all, this is a change that we all share. Mm -hmm. so. uh, Alex. Yeah, I'd like to address our because it's very different from yours. We're, we're a residential campus. We're um, very traditional. Before COVID, when the instructors would try to innovate uh, flip classes, they would get pretty big hits on the teaching centers, actually, because they're saying, I'm paying $55,000 a year. They don't want to come and watch a video. So um, that was that was a big challenge. And what we're trying to work with faculty in our centers is we call it not less than what you're going to cover chapter by chapter, what, how are you going to organize your conference, but how do we experience plan, not lesson plan? How do, how do we rethink the time we have in the classroom um, to, to make it worthwhile to be in that classroom? Um, the interesting barrier we had too is coming out of the pandemic that after two or three semesters, we actually had to ban the use of, we called it uh, dual mode classrooms, with this idea of, of, of asynchronous and asynchronous because they wanted to preserve our residential campus. Uh, they didn't want to make it a guarantee that every professor would have to continue to offer this. Um, we also got caught up in legal things in the United States with, um, you might have seen with the MOOCs and the edX when they, the accessibility, when some people uh, had some legitimate concerns that it wasn't reaching everybody, so it took it down. So we were worried about, if you're asking, if you're offering Zoom for the elite football player while well, he's away at a football game, but you're not giving points to a student with ADHD who needs how is that fair? So we're, we're really wrestling with how do we you know, tame this coming out of the pandemic, um, legally, socially, pedagogically. Um, but one thing I'm, I'm very excited about is this seven digit uh, dollar commitment we made to our, our, our learning spaces has been committed to move forward uh, beyond, beyond COVID. So uh, my hope is that this will transform the learning to make it more flexible, more blended, uh, more active learning. Less, less front of teaching. And, um, and we're also excited about, uh, as we've heard, the challenges of assessments, the decrease of what we call blue books and bubble sheets to traditional on the spot with more authentic and project based uh, assessments, something exciting that's continuing through. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Uh, just one comment. Uh, I think uh, I would like to add two more, maybe, phases. First, we talked about a lot about the uh, right, sorry. <laughs> First, <laughs> we talked a lot about the uh, using technology as a tool in our uh, 
in our classes. But I think that one of the main challenges for us is first to guide the instructors to bring or to raise awareness about the possibilities. What is uh, how we can use these tools? What is what can be expected? And to understand that using technology is not only online; it could be in class as well. So this is kind of thing that needs to be changed when we speak about um, teaching or this new area of teaching. The other thing that I would like to address is the skills. I think that we are talking a lot about the students and what we are, why they want to come, how we can engage them. I think one of the main things is what kind of skills we want them to gain besides knowledge. Knowledge, as we can see, they can learn from videos, they can learn from text, but what is the added value for them to come to the campus? What kind of skills do you like to uh, provide them? And this is a big challenge, uh, I think, for all starts as the instructors, as the educators. All right, thank you. Yeah, do you want to add something? No, maybe just also, no, yes. Uh, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> maybe just we didn't mention the, 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 the obstacles that we have from the teacher's perspective, uh, uh, it requires a lot of work. There are also the administrative things that I'm not sure it's also applicable in the, in the outside of Israel, that if I teach only an hour in class, what does it mean? Does it mean that I have to, that my teaching load will will uh, will grow? Uh, so, so these are also questions that kind of, uh, that are at the center of the things that we are thinking about at the moment. And I think it's, relevant to at least in this way to all the institutions. And I think we just may add to this uh, the question of the Elmo of the I think we want to go crazy, like uh, Shelly said. We want to break the walls and we want to do, uh, you know, do creative things. So there's always the tension between this and that, and I think that this is also a main challenge for me. Interesting. Yeah. So we do see how culture merges um, into everything. Okay. So let's take a few questions from the audience. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I have two questions. Uh, one is uh, regarding the students. Do you see any uh, differences in the preferences of uh, students who started uh, their degree before the COVID to students who started their degree during the COVID? And the second question is regarding the number of tools that we can use for each semester, like uh, HMHP, Mentimeter, Zoom, uh, kind of elements, maybe it's going to be too much and great uh, overlap for students and instructors. <laughs> Yes, uh, <laughs> in our case, we have noticed in Greece that the students that they started their studies during the COVID, they continue to have the same habits after COVID. Mm -hmm. So they are not coming to the amphitheaters, they are trying to follow everything, you know, online and video recording. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's still, we are facing how to, to bring them, you know, back to the amphitheater. So this is the, the, for the first thing. For the second thing, probably we are overdoing it uh, because we don't know, we are exp still experimenting. Because don't forget that the COVID was two years, and I'm a teacher, you know, from 2004. So all the bad habits, or you know, all the knowledge that I have, you know, it's based on, on the face to face. So in, in, I, at least in our case, we are still experiment. We have finalized somehow the tools that we are using, the online tools within the face to face classroom. But um, yeah, sometimes I think that we confuse them because we don't have a decision. All of us as an institution it depends on the individual. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I hope this is not going to upset anyone, but uh, I'm going to take this uh, conversation in a different direction. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Uh, Noah Shotel from the Israeli College of Jerusalem. Um, so in my experience, uh, most of our students post COVID <coughs> have come to the agreement that uh, the best way to learn is still to be in the classroom. So the great majority of our students are more than happy to do that and see the advantages of in-class learning more than the advantages of being outside uh, or at home. So there's no question that high-flex hybrid and all of that is a path we should pursue, as Ray mentioned. At the same time, my question to everyone here is, are we not shooting ourselves in the leg by 
um, giving more and more and more options to the students to study outside of the classroom. Because at the end of the day, the way I see it, is that we should be looking at achievements. Are we improving the achievements of the students or are we lowering the achievements of the students because we are allowing, allowing them to be out of the class as much as they want? Because this is what we need to look at, in my opinion. And again, at the end of the day, we're here specifically for a specific reason today. But Meital, as, as a whole, would like to improve the quality of teaching and of learning. So are we improving the, the ability of the students to, to learn, or are we actually? Um, <laughs> yes, thank you. So that, that, that's a, a little bit of a hard question. Yeah, I don't yeah, know one directly yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. But uh, before, the ninth, before the ninth day answer, before we talk about ecosystems, could you describe in two sentences your institution? Um, sure. And we have a lot of, uh, well, the, um, as a college, I think we are uh, second or third as far as the size, about uh, 1,400 students. Uh, that's really. That's really, that's really yeah. yes. Um, it's the Hebrew U. Uh, yeah, we're across the street from the Hebrew University. Everybody who comes to us is uh, basically pursuing a, a second degree at Hebrew U. Um, engineering college. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that's important. Yeah, so, very yes, there are a lot of open spaces, and we encourage the students to, to study together. And again, the students who come to, to, to our college post COVID are more than aware of the advantages, and I'm not just speaking about the immediate uh, access to the uh, to the faculty, but they, they realize that being in class and the, the social interaction aspect of being together, um, it basically creates a more, uh, um, a greater um, high quality environment of study, which they, which they can't achieve at home. So, um, I don't feel that maybe our uh, institute is officially addressing or officially uh, <coughs> um, recommending to come, but I think we should um, as, a, as an institute. So again, I'm not saying that, that we should uh, um, throw all of this into the garbage. As, as Rui said, uh, we, we should go wide, uh, ride the wave and, and, and continue to pursue and improve uh, our capabilities of what we can offer them. At the same time, I do think um, and I hope that I'm not in completely minority here, uh, that we should uh, recommend to the students or actively recommend to the students um, as an institute that there is no replacement. Uh, okay. 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 Even if you are a minority, that's fine. <laughs> I'm used to being in the minority. Uh, okay. 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 That just did all good. I thought she was. Uh... Yeah, I just want to say that, uh, that, that I don't think anyone here was talking about. Uh, replacing online with face-to-face. -face. The question is how can you use both both uh, modes of learning in, in order to, to get the best of both worlds? Because at least in, at our institution, the engineering classes are three hours. Today, students can sit for three hours and really absorb everything. They don't have time to understand it before they have to, before the next topic is, uh, is already presented. So if some of the, the, the concepts are presented beforehand and they uh, uh, enter class after they have some time to absorb, then they, then they will, hopefully they will uh, understand and uh, assimilate better the knowledge. So I think that the, the, the question is, how do we use technology in order to improve the learning and not in order to just, uh, you know, not just imitate the classroom into uh, uh, into Zoom or uh, Coursera or anything. Yes, I, I understand that. It's just that, uh, again. And again, uh, if, they, if they don't feel that, if they're not coming, then it means that they feel that, 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 that there's not there's any advantage. So I think it's our role as teachers to make sure that they feel that there is an advantage to coming into the classroom. And again, it's also the students. There's also a change in students at least in Israel that are more uh, goal-oriented. They want a degree. They're not necessarily interested in the process of learning. They just want the, the, the end. And I think in the past, they saw more uh, uh, value also in the process of learning and not just in, uh, uh, you know, having the degree in order to find a good job. I think that also affects them. Even if the, the lecture is like super, uh, like a uh, a great lecture, and uh, they still might not come because they prefer to work. Have uh, so, so. uh, uh, Sorry, Shai, uh, you wanted to. <coughs> yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I just uh, couldn't help myself to respond. But uh, there's a few decades on of research on online teaching, and 
if you ask what does the research say about online versus classroom, it's simple, no significant yes. difference. Okay? And I think I, I fully agree with what you said. It's not about, I mean, of course, if you put a Zoom, if you put a camera before a lecture and tell it to talk 90 minutes, that's a very good form of torture. It's not easy, mm -hmm. right? But you can you can do social online, you can do collaborative, you can do active. I think we saw very good examples of these here. So it's, sorry? Labs. You can do virtual labs. Okay, so, so it's not the question, it's not that the best good teaching is in class. And it's not that you should try to replicate class online. It's that you should find how to teach well online. And there are ways to do it. And I don't think that's kind of the message that we had from the panel. So, uh, um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, so, so please, last comment because we are really in the 90 minute time. So I, I want an example, okay, I have a frustrated teacher who is actually saying, I don't want to provide them with extra out of class online materials, okay? I want them to collect fun, to, to learn from me. And then you know what happens? That's what he says. You know what happens? They go and they watch somebody else's videos. <laughs> so not only they watch different material that I want them to learn, they are actually confident that this is the syllabus because that's the title okay and i'm teaching something else i'm teaching more in that i'm teaching i'm teaching different so if you don't guide them if you don't offer them the materials you think are the ones that they should get they will just go you can't you can't take it away from them they are going to go and they're going to find something and they are going to use it out of class out of your control and you will not even know why eventually they come to the exam and get like <laughs> the grades they get because they didn't study from the material you wanted to study. You can't contain them, you can't prevent them from accessing knowledge, it's all over the place. You can only guide them and choose what you should want them to learn. They live so high, so well behaved. They live uh, high. I, 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 I want to know why. I do want to know why your students are there. <laughs> but uh, I suggest that we we'll keep this uh, conversation offline. We'll have a lunch break for that. We are at the 90 minutes uh, line already. Thank you very much.